section 7.3, trigonometric substitution. The idea here is that if we have a square root as part of our integrand and we want to do the integral, then it would be good to get rid of the square root because they're kind of a pain to deal with. So if we have the square root of, let's say, a squared, then we know it's easy to get rid of the square root. That's just the absolute value of a. And if a is positive, that's even better. That's just a. So what if we don't have just an a squared, though? Instead, we have some difference of two squares, or even a difference in general, and that we could just take the square root of uh, each of these guys and pretend that they're perfect squares. But how do we deal with that? Well, remember that we have identities that um, get rid of differences and return squares, these trig identities. So if we have 1 minus sine squared, we could replace that with cosine squared. If we have 1 plus tangent squared, that could be secant squared. Secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. These are both the same, really, and they get, both get proved from this guy anyway. So now you're thinking, okay, well, I don't have 1, I have a. You know, I want to make this as general as possible. Well, you could factor out a. You could take it out of both of these guys. So you could say it's uh, a squared times 1 minus x over a squared. So then it should make sense that I want to do some sort of substitution for x that has an a in it. Because that way when I factor out, I don't have to worry about dividing by a. So on the inside, I would have uh, 1 minus some trig function squared. And then that would be converted. And I could take the square root and not have to worry about it. Even better would be if I knew that when I took the absolute value, I always had a positive number. So we combine all of these you know, desirable properties together, and we substitute in some trig function with a. We make sure to restrict our value of theta to make sure that when we take the absolute value, it's positive, And we end up with a nice little uh, table of substitutions. So when you're trying to decide which one to substitute, think about which identity you want to use. If you have a squared minus x squared, think about that as like 1 minus some trig function squared. So that would be 1 minus sine squared. If you've got a squared plus x squared, think about 1 plus some trig function squared. So that's 1 plus tangent squared. If you have x squared minus a squared, think about uh, some trig function squared minus 1. And that would be secant squared minus 1. So let's do an example. Let's try to evaluate the uh, square root of 9x squared over x squared when we take the integral. So like I said, we have something minus x squared. Pretend that's 1 minus a trig function squared. So 1 minus, well, a trig function would be sine. 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. So let's let x equal a cosine theta where a squared is that first number. So if a squared is 9, a is 3. So we're going to let x equal 3 sine theta. We're going to restrict theta to make sure that when we look at cosine, when we do our substitute, when we do our identity, that it'll be positive. So we restrict theta to be between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2 which will make cosine positive. So then dx is equal to 3 cosine theta d theta. So let's take a look at what happens to this uh, square root. Hopefully we can get rid of it entirely. So we have 9 minus x squared. And we're going to replace x with 3 sine theta. So that becomes 9 minus 9 sine squared because we square x. So then we factor out the 9. We get 9 times 1 minus sine squared. But that's just 9 times cosine squared because we use our identity. So then the square root of 9 is 3. The square root of cosine squared is the absolute value of cosine. However, because of our theta restriction, x is always positive in this half of the unit circle. It's like over here, from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2, x is always positive. So that means that cosine theta is positive, and we just have 3 cosine theta. So now we substitute into our integral. We get that the square root of 9 minus x squared over x squared dx 
is equal to 3 cosine theta over 9 sine squared theta, right? Because the square root is 3 cosine theta, like we said. And then x was 3 sine theta, so x squared is 9 sine squared. Now we just have to replace dx, but we said dx was 3 cosine theta d theta, so we throw that in there. And you might be thinking, wow, we just made it so much worse, but actually we made it so much better because now we just have the nines cancel. We have cosine squared over sine squared. And that's just cotangent squared. So we can use um, an identity on cotangent squared. Remember, tangent squared is secant squared minus 1. Cotangent squared is cosecant squared minus 1. So we can write that like that. Cosecant squared minus 1. And as we've done previously, uh, the, d, the integral or the antiderivative of cosecant squared is minus cotangent because the derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. Remember, derivative of tangent is secant squared. Derivative of cotangent is minus cosecant squared. So we get minus cotangent theta. And then 1 when we take the antiderivative becomes theta plus c. OK, we have one last issue, though. All of this is in terms of theta. Our original integral was in terms of x. This is an indefinite integral. We have to return to where we started, kind of like when you're substituting back in for u. So in order to do that, we need to figure out what the cotangent of theta is. So how about we draw a triangle? It's a little too perfect. There we go. OK, so we have theta. We know that by our substitution, x was equal to 3 sine theta. So that means sine of theta is equal to x divided by 3. Sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So opposite is x, and hypotenuse is 3. So now we use the Pythagorean theorem to get the last side of our triangle. This, uh, let's say we call it b, then b squared plus x squared is 9. So if we solve for b, that would have to be the square root of the hypotenuse 9 minus the other side, x squared. So let's plug in for cotangent now. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so that would be x over square root 9 minus x squared. But cotangent is adjacent over opposite, so that would be square root of 9 minus x squared divided by x. And then sine of theta is x over 3. So if I want to solve for theta, I do sine inverse. So theta must be equal to sine inverse of x over 3. And we keep our plus c. Let's find the area enclosed by the ellipse x squared plus y squared, sorry, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. So if we draw the ellipse, it looks very roughly something like this. Let's see. Very roughly. You definitely have to use your imagination for this one because it's supposed to be symmetrical. All right, so here's the x-intercept a 0, y-intercept 0, b, oops, and we want to find the area of this thing. So if I had drawn this correctly, you would see that the area of each of these four pieces of the ellipse in the four quadrants are all equal to each other. So finding the area of this thing is the exact same thing as just finding the area 
of just this piece in the fourth quadrant, in the first quadrant, and multiplying it by four. That'll save us a bit of time when doing our integral. So how about we try solving for y so we could see what we want to integrate. So we can say that y squared over b squared is equal to one minus x squared over a squared by subtracting that from both sides. Find a common denominator and we get a squared minus x squared over a squared. So we multiply both sides by b squared and then we take the square root and we get that y is equal to plus or minus b over a times the square root of a squared minus x squared. However, we only want to look at this in the first quadrant. That'll save us time, we won't have to deal with the minus. So let's only consider y equals the positive b over a times the square root of a squared minus x squared, and only consider x starting at zero, up until a. So that means that 1 fourth of the area is equal to the integral from 0 to a of b over a times the square root of a squared minus x squared dx because integrating the height of this curve will give me the area underneath it. So this uh, integrand, integrand has a square root and it's not a nice square root we can get rid of immediately so we think okay let's do a trig substitution pretend that it's 1 minus some trig function squared so the trig identity that matches would be 1 minus sine squared so again we substitute a sine theta for x so if we do that and we leave theta restricted uh, in this case we're starting x at 0 so we'll start theta at 0 also and we'll go from 0 to pi over 2 so then dx is equal to a cosine theta d theta and we have to be a little bit careful here because this is a definite integral unlike our previous example so we need to look at what the theta limits become during our substitution. So when x is equal to 0, that means that 0 is a sine theta, so 0 is sine theta, and theta is from 0 to pi over 2, so that means that theta must be 0. If I look at x equals a, that means a equals a sine theta. So I divide both sides by a, I get sine theta is equal to 1. And again, my restriction on theta tells me that theta is equal to pi over 2. So that means that the square root of a squared minus x squared is equal to the square root of a squared minus a squared sine squared theta. And then we factor out a squared, we get a squared times 1 minus sine squared, so that's a squared times cosine squared when we do our trig substitution identity. And that's just a times the absolute value of cosine, which is just a times cosine because of our theta restriction. Okay, so this makes our integral a lot easier. If our integral was one-fourth of the area, then we should just multiply by four to get the total area. So our area is equal to four times b over a times the integral from zero to a of the square root of a squared minus x squared dx. We do our substitution and we get that this is four times b over a times the integral from 0 to pi over 2 times a cosine theta for the square root. Then dx was also a cosine theta, 
So we multiply by another one of those, coincidentally. So then that equals, well, a times a is a squared on the inside. So a squared cancels with the a on the bottom and leaves me with 1a left. So I get 4ab. And we have the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine squared. And remember, we can use our double or half angle identity. So this becomes half 1 plus cosine 2 theta. And that becomes, well, now it's easy enough to integrate. We can get 2ab times theta plus half sine 2 theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. Notice when integrating cosine 2 theta, we get half sine 2 theta by doing a mental substitution. If you were to go backwards, you would take cosine 2 theta, and then you would multiply by the derivative of the inside, which is 2, which would cancel that half and just leave you with cosine 2 theta without the half. So we evaluate this from 0 to pi over 2. We get this 2ab times pi over 2 plus 0, because sine of pi over 2 is 0. And then when we plug in 0 for theta and sine 2 pi, we also get 0. So that's just pi ab. So that's pretty cool. That means that the area of any ellipse of this form is just pi ab. So if we let a equal b, then this becomes a circle. Well, that's even worse. Oh my gosh, I shouldn't have drawn that. This becomes a circle. So that means that we get pi times a times a, pi a squared. So pi r squared. So not only have we proven the area of an ellipse, but we've even proven it for the special case where the two axes are of equal length and it becomes a circle. So we've proven, you know, pretty cool formulas all at once. Okay, let's try another example. In this case, we have a square root with something squared plus a number. So pretend that that's trig function squared plus 1. Trig squared plus 1, or 1 plus trig squared, that would be 1 plus tangent squared. So I think that's what we should substitute in. So we'll substitute x equals a tan theta, where a is the square root of that because 4 is a squared. So we're subbing in 2 tan theta. Our theta restriction in this case is from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And that means that dx is equal to 2 times secant squared. So let's see what happens to our square root now. We get x squared plus 4 is equal to the square root of 4 times tangent squared plus 1, which is equal to square root of 4 secant squared. And that's equal to 2 times the absolute value of secant, which is going to be positive because of our restriction on theta. So we get that our integral is the integral of dx over x squared times the square root of x squared plus 4, which is equal to the integral of 2 secant squared d theta all over 4 tangent squared times 2 secant. Notice that dx was the 2 secant squared. That's where the top came in. On the bottom, we had x equals 2 tangent theta, so x squared is 4 tangent squared, and then our square root became the 2 secant theta.
So this is equal to 1 fourth times the integral of secant over tangent because of all the cancellations we have. Oh, and I almost forgot my square. So then that becomes 1 fourth times the integral of 1 over cosine for secant times cosine squared over sine squared for the 1 over tangent squared. Because 1 over tangent squared is cotangent squared. So then that becomes 1 fourth times the integral of cosine over sine squared d theta. So in order to do this, we should probably do a quick u substitution. So we let u equal sine theta. That means that du is cosine theta d theta. So then we get our integral dx over the square root, sorry, x squared times the square root of x squared plus 4 is equal to 1 fourth of cosine over sine squared as we calculated. And with our substitution, that's 1 fourth of the integral du over u squared. So that's equal to 1 fourth of times minus 1 over u plus c. Wonderful. Because u, 1 over u squared is u to the minus 2, and then it becomes u to the minus 1. We take the antiderivative. So let's sub back in for u, because this is an indefinite integral. And we get minus 1 over 4 sine theta plus c. So that's the same as minus cosecant theta over 4 plus c. But there's one problem. Again, original integral is in terms of x. We sub back in for u, which was admirable, but we did not uh, finish yet by plugging back in for theta. In the previous example, we managed to avoid having to replace uh, theta because it was a definite integral, so we just switched our limits and then we kept going. We didn't have to sub back. In this case, we have to draw our triangle again. So if here's theta, we said originally that x was equal to 2 tan theta. So x over 2 is tangent theta. So tangent is opposite over adjacent, so the opposite must be x and the adjacent must be 2. So then when we do the Pythagorean theorem, we get that x squared plus 2 squared is c squared, so the hypotenuse is x squared plus 4. So now we can go and figure out what cosecant is. Cosecant is 1 over sine, so that's hypotenuse over opposite. So that's the square root of x squared plus 4 over x. So I keep my 4, put in my x, and keep my plus c. Okay, so this is kind of a cool example because it's got a square root in it. So you're thinking, okay, well it's x squared plus 4, I should do trig squared plus 1 and do tangent again. However, I've got an x in the numerator, which is awesome, because that means that if I were just to let u equal x squared plus 4, I'd get 2x dx, I could do u substitution, and I wouldn't even have to worry about doing a trig substitution. So let's do that. Let u equal x squared plus 4. Then du is equal to 2x dx. So our integral becomes one half the integral of du over square root of u. 
which is just square root of u plus c when we do our antiderivative. We sub back in for u and we get that that's square root of x squared plus 4 plus c. Wonderful. So sometimes you can do trig substitution if you want, but you don't always have to. If you have something that you can let um, u equal so that du will end up eliminating, like this x in our numerator, which is conveniently there, so that when we take du, it goes away, then you don't have to worry about trig substitution. Okay, so now we have finally have an example where we have trig squared minus a squared, so it's, let's say trig squared minus 1. So trig squared minus 1 is uh, secant squared minus 1 is tangent. So let's let x equal a secant theta. And that means that theta has a more complicated restriction in this case to make sure that tangent is positive because tangent is positive in quadrants 1 and 3. So that means that theta needs to be from 0 to pi over 2 or from pi to 3 pi over 2. And it helps when I actually draw my less than sign. So then we take dx and then we get that that's the derivative of secant, so that's secant tangent. So let's see what happens to our square root. x squared minus a squared becomes square root of a squared times secant squared minus 1, which is square root of oh, a squared tangent squared which is just a times the absolute value of tangent, which will be positive. So then let's see what happens to our integral. So we get uh, dx is a secant tangent. And then our square root is a tangent, and we have our d theta. Well, that's wonderful. Tangent and a both cancel. We just have the integral of secant. And previously, we said that the integral of secant is the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus tangent. So that means it's the natural log Oh, well, in order to replace secant theta, we probably need a triangle. So let's see. We said that x is a secant theta, so x over a is secant. So cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. 1 over cosine is hypotenuse over adjacent. So x is hypotenuse, and adjacent is a. That means that my last side becomes the square root of x squared minus a squared. So we have the natural log of secant, which we said is x over a by our substitu original substitution. And then tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that's square root of x squared minus a squared over a. We keep our plus c. Okay, if we want to be fancy at this point, we can keep writing. Use a, a natural logarithm laws. So we have x plus the square root of x squared minus a squared minus l and a. Because we can find a common denominator over here, and then we have a quotient inside of a logarithm, so we can just subtract logarithms. But then minus L and A plus C is a constant. It's a completely arbitrary constant, so we might as well rewrite that as its own constant. So we get LN of absolute value of X plus 
square root of x squared minus a squared plus c1, where this constant c1 is equal to c minus l and a. Notice this looks a little familiar. It should be reminiscent of when we looked at hyperbolic trig functions. Those uh, hyperbolic functions uh, have this uh, identity over here. So that means that potentially we could have evaluated this integral instead of using a trig substitution, but instead use a uh, hyperbolic substitution. We could have used x equals a cosine hyperbolic um, t and then use the identity cosh squared minus sin squared equals one. But because trig substitutions are so much more familiar, in general, we'll just use trig substitutions and safe hyperbolic substitutions for people who just love hyperbolic functions. So sometimes it's not immediately obvious that we can do a trig substitution. In this case, we don't have a uh, square root staring us in the face unless we actually take a look at this 4x squared plus 9 to the 3 over 2 in our denominator. If we look at that more closely, well, to the, anything to the half power is a square root. So this is the same thing as the square root of 4x squared plus 9 to the third. So that's the same thing as the square root of 2x squared plus 9 to the third. Notice I've rewritten the 4x squared because in all of our previous examples we just had x squared plus a squared or a squared minus x squared. We didn't have any coefficient. In order to actually be able to do this problem we need to substitute according to our table which means that we need some variable squared. So in this case the variable that we're going to substitute is not x, it's going to have to be 2x. So we just have to be a little bit careful of that. If we treat this as its own variable, let's say like u, then this is u squared minus a squared, where a is 3 because of the 9. So, trigs, so trig function squared plus 1 is what we should be thinking. 1 plus trig function squared is 1 plus tangent squared. That's the identity we use. So let's substitute tangent. So we take our variable, 2x in this case, and we replace that with a tangent theta, which is 3 tangent theta because of the 3 squared. And we divide by 2. We get x is equal to 3 over 2 times tangent theta. So that means that dx is 3 over 2 times derivative of tangent, which is secant squared. So let's see what happens to our square root. Square root of 4x squared plus 9 becomes the square root of 9 tangent squared plus 9. We factor out 9, we get 9 times 1 plus tangent squared, which is secant squared. We take the square root and we get 3 times secant. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful. This is a definite integral. So let's also change our limits. When x is 0, well, that means that this is 0, so we divide by 3, we just get tangent theta is equal to 0. So that happens when sine is 0, which is at 0. So theta is 0. If x is equal to 3 rad 3 over 2, then I plug in 3 rad 3 over 2 for x, 3 over 2 cancels on both sides. We just have that tangent is equal to rad 3. Okay, so tangent is rad 3 at that part of the unit circle where sine is rad 3 over 2 and cosine is a half. Right? So sine is rad 3 over 2, cosine is a half. That's where the x value is smaller, so that's over here. Then, rad th then the dividing by 2 cancels with half and just leaves you rad, rad 3 when you do the division for tangent. So this is happening at an angle of pi over 3. 
So that means that theta is pi over 3, 1 tangent to square root of 3. So we can now do our substitution for our integral. So we get that the integral becomes x cubed over 4x squared plus 9 to 3 over 2. And that's now from 0 to pi over 3. OK, so x cubed. So I'll take this thing and cube it. I get 27 over 8 tangent cubed. And then in my denominator, I just have that square root. But I have that cubed also. So that becomes 27 secant cubed. And then dx is 3 over 2 secant squared. OK, so we still have a little bit more work to do. This is going to be 3 over 16 times the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of tangent cubed over secant. Because we cancel two of the secants, and we cancel the 27s. So we get 3 over 16 times the integral from 0 to pi over 3 of sine cubed over cosine squared. So that's just 3 over 16 times the integral of 1 minus cosine squared over cosine squared. And we did that for cosine, for sine squared on top, so we still have one sine left over. OK, so it looks like we still have a mess. And we do still have a mess, but it's a little bit of a better mess because we got cosine. And we've got a um, derivative for cosine over here, as long as we put in a minus. So we can do a u substitution. So we do a u equals cosine theta, du equals minus sine theta, d theta. Unfortunately, this means we have to mess with our limits a second time. Well, when theta is equal to 0, let's see what u is equal to. Uh, it's cosine of 0, so that's 1. When theta is equal to pi over 3, then cosine of pi over 3 is a half, as we mentioned before. So our integral, which started as 3 rad 3 over 2, x cubed over uh, 4x squared plus 9 to 3 over 2, now becomes the, well, let's pull up the minus, minus 3 over 16 from minus sine theta, and then the integral from 1 to 1 half of 1 minus well, uh, we made u cosine, so 1 minus u squared over u squared du. Which is uh, way better, because now this is just 3 over 16 times the integral from 1 to 1 half of 1 minus u to the minus 2 du. So we wrap this up by getting 3 over 16 times the antiderivative u plus 1 over u evaluated from 1 to a half, which is just 3 over 16 times 1 half plus 2 minus 1 plus 1, which is equal to 3 over 32. So you might be thinking, wow, that was pretty awful. And you would be completely right. But at least we didn't have to go and plug back into our triangle to replace uh, u and theta you know, a couple times because it was a definite integral. So we just have to be careful keeping track of our limits. Notice that 
Just because you do trig substitution doesn't mean that you can't use u substitution also. So you can use multiple different um, integration techniques all together in one example. So in this example, we don't have a square root of something minus something squared. We have a 2x in the middle getting in the way. But we can still do trig substitution if we persevere. All we have to do is complete the square. So let's take a look at 3 minus 2x minus x squared. Well, that's 3 minus x squared plus 2x. If I just factor out the minus in the second two terms, so that's 3 plus 1 minus x squared plus 2x plus 1. I add and subtract 1 because 1 is half of the middle term squared, and that's how we complete the square. Adding and subtracting 1 is the same as adding 0. So now we have a perfect square trinomial. 3 plus 1 is 4 and our trinomial when we factor it becomes x plus 1 squared. So now as before, in the square root I have a squared and I have some variable squared. In your head you can do a u substitution, say that u is equal to x plus 1, then you've got a squared minus u squared where a is 2 and u is x plus 1. I think it's a little bit easier just to pretend that x plus 1 is a variable on its own and just make that the substitution. So if we have a squared minus trig function squared, think about that like 1 minus trig function squared. Well, that's 1 minus sine squared for the identity. So let's let x plus 1 equal a sine theta. So x plus 1 is equal to 2 sine theta. Subtracting 1, we get x is equal to 2 sine theta minus 1. So then dx is equal to 2 cosine theta d theta. Let's take a look at what happens to our square root. So that's 4 minus x plus 1 squared. And now it's 4 minus 4 sine squared theta. OK, beautiful. So that's just 2 cosine theta. So our integral x over this square root becomes the integral of 2 sine theta minus 1 over 2 cosine theta, right? Because x is 2 sine theta minus 1. Our square root, we said, is 2 cosine theta. And then dx is 2 cosine theta d theta. So this is equal to the integral of 2 sine theta minus 1 d theta, because the 2 cosine cancels. So we take the antiderivative, and we just get minus 2 cosine theta minus theta plus c. We do our triangle. Let me go farther to the left. That way I got room. OK, so we have theta. And we said that uh, 2 sine theta is x plus 1. So x plus 1 over 2 is equal to sine. So opposite over hypotenuse, so opposite is x plus 1, and hypotenuse is 2. And we do the Pythagorean theorem. We get that the last side is 4 minus x plus 1 squared. So we can substitute back in now. We get this is minus 2 times cosine, which is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's the square root of 4 minus x plus 1 squared over 2 minus theta, which is 
Remember, sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, so sine inverse of x plus 1 over 2 is equal to theta. And if we really want, we can rewrite this to be more similar to our original problem, because remember, this 4 minus x plus 1 squared was after we completed the square. Originally, it was 3 minus 2x minus x squared. So how do we write this as, well, the 2 over 2 cancels, so we have minus square root of 3 minus 2x minus x squared minus sine inverse of x plus 1 over 2 plus C.